Welcome back to Healthcare Triage Podcast. We got an exciting show for you this week. One of my really good friends, Tyson Newman, is here. He's another part of our gaming group. You might remember uh, Tim Broach, another person from that group, was a guest just a few weeks ago. Uh, But before we get to him, let's recap some of the stuff going on in the news. The big story that I think we're all focusing on at the moment, or at least that you should be focusing on at the moment, is what's going on in Idaho with respect to the healthcare exchanges. So you may remember from many of our episodes as well as the podcast, that right now the Affordable Care Act regulates all of the insurance plans that can be offered on the insurance exchanges. They have to conform to certain rules. The big ones being that they have to be community rated, meaning that everybody sort of gets the same rate regardless of whether they have a pre-existing condition, regardless of the size of their family, how many kids you might have. You, you all basically get the same thing. The only thing they regulate it on is age. There's also guaranteed issue, meaning that they have to offer you a plan no matter what. Uh, and the other thing is that there are no annual or lifetime limits, meaning it doesn't matter how much you spend, the insurance is going to last forever. And for most people, the annual or lifetime limits are not a big deal. But of course, For a number of children who are born with severe illnesses, think about hemophilia, think about cystic fibrosis, you'd be surprised how quickly you can hit a million dollars in the cap. And if you've had, you know, a really bad cancer, even a really bad trauma accident, those things come into play as well. If your insurance runs out, that's a real problem. And so one of the big things the ACA did was get rid of those annual and lifetime limits. So what's going on in Idaho is basically that the state government is saying, let's pretend none of what I just said exists. They're going to allow insurance companies to start issuing plans that don't comply with those rules. They will allow people to be individually rated. They will allow insurance companies to say, we're going to charge you, say, 50% more because you have a chronic condition in your family. They're going to allow plans to have annual or lifetime limits. In other words, they might say, again, the million-dollar cap might be there. These plans are clearly in violation of the Affordable Care Act, in violation of federal law. Uh, As our good friend Nicholas Bagley has said in the very recent past, these are crazy pants, or this idea is crazy pants. That's the actual legal term he uses. So the problem is, what do we do about it? Uh, States can sort of do what they want. And unless the federal government decides to go after them, what are we going to do? The Trump administration would have to bring a case or have to go after Idaho and say these are illegal and bring it to court and prove that they are illegal. There's no question that they're illegal. The problem is that it depends on the federal government acting. What we could wind up with is a situation much like we see with marijuana, where individual states are passing laws and deciding not to prosecute or even legalize marijuana in clear defiance of federal law. And unless the federal government goes after them, they can be allowed to continue that. Of course, if the federal government does go after them, it would create real problems in those states. I don't even know what would happen. I'm not a lawyer. The the bottom line is that unless the federal government really steps in, Idaho, I guess, can do what Idaho wants. Now, another question is what will happen with respect to insurance companies? Will they want to issue plans that are clearly in violation of federal law, knowing that they could be taken away? I think when we talked to you last episode, I had said, I didn't even know if insurance companies are going to do that. Evidently, at least one insurer looks like they're going to issue plans. Uh, If that happens, then we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, most experts are concerned that we're going to see some significant adverse selection, that healthier people will opt for the cheaper plans that have lifetime limits and, of course, don't really penalize them for being healthy. Sick people will remain in the exchanges, in which case all the people in the exchanges, their insurance will go up and up and up. And that's where we get into what we call death spirals. And even though if it doesn't go to a death spiral, we definitely would see some sort of adverse selection. But we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen with respect to HHS, whether our new Secretary of Health and Human Services is going to to say that these are legal and need to go after them. We don't know whether the Justice Department will bring cases. We don't know certainly where President Trump will come down in this. But the real issue, I think, again, is even if they allow this to go forward, should a Democratic president or even a president who wants to enforce the ACA get elected in 2020, then all of this could go away again. And so the real problem here is chaos. The real problem here is we don't have a stable decision about how the Affordable Care Act is going to be enforced, and chaos does not work well when it comes to a stable insurance market. Uh, So we're going to keep an eye on this as we move forward, but certainly lots to watch for in Idaho and the rest of the country as we move forward. And with that, let's turn to our guest. I'm really excited to have here Dr. Tyson Newman. I'm going to let him introduce himself and talk to you about sort of his education and how he got to where he is. But the big thing is he's a critical care doc. He's also a pulmonary doc. How often are pulmonary docs critical care docs? 
It depends on the part of the country you're in. Okay, well, he's going to talk about both, but that means he takes care sort of the sickest of the sick. He works in an intensive care unit. He takes care of the patients that are really difficult, and I wanted to bring him in to talk about, one, what he does, and two, some of the more difficult aspects of his job, uh, some of which we touched on when we talked with Tim about palliative care. But let me start by bringing in Tyson and saying thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Um, Can you talk a little bit about what you do? sort of how you decided that that's what you want to do, your training and, and how you get here. Remembering that much of our audience is completely naive to how a, you know, a doctor is trained, how people in the medical system get there, how much time and effort and everything else it takes. So if you could go into detail, that'd be great. So I do critical care and pulmonary. And to, what I do on a most daily basis is deal with people on life support in the various types. And I use life support in a broad term. Anybody on a ventilator, that's a tube down their windpipe to, with a machine to breathe for them. Anybody on a continuous dialysis that they don't, not the people that walk into their clinic three times a week, but the people that if you stop the dialysis, they at any point in a 24 or 48 hour period or something that they couldn't keep going. Dialysis is if your kidneys stop functioning, then you need to be on a machine basically to clean your blood in the way that the kidneys normally would. So if you're on continuous dialysis, that's not the, you know, they hook you up to a machine for a few hours a day right. or however it is. Yes. So continuous dialysis is when your salts and minerals are out of whack so much that you need that constantly. Can you leave a hospital on continuous dialysis? No. Okay. Um, continuous medical drips that keep your blood pressure and your heart up and constantly working. And then sometimes there's even heart machines and even crazier stuff than that. From a training standpoint and how I got here, I did college in uh, Columbia, Missouri. Mm-hmm. And I spent four years there doing a um, bachelor's in uh, biochemistry. And then I went and did four years of medical school also in Columbia, Missouri at the University of Missouri. Then I did residency here in Indianapolis as med peds because when I was starting, I was going to be a, an adult and pediatric lung doctor and take care of cystic fibrosis, oh, which you, you go. mentioned earlier in uh, healthcare triage. But then I fell in love with critical care um, because I'm kind of a want answers now, want results now, don't want to wait five years to see if you're cured of your cancer. And I know within a couple of days, sometimes to a couple of weeks, if someone's going to make it rather than five years, if you're going to be cured of your cancer. Sure. And for me, there's also a lot of procedures in critical care that I find interesting. And so I then spent, after my four years of adult and pediatric training, three more years doing adult pulmonary and critical care because here it's a combined fellowship program. Though in different parts of the country, you can do either a fellowship in pulmonary, which is two years, or a fellowship in critical care, which is two years. Why do you think they merged them? Originally, most of the people in intensive care unit were either on a life support machine and that's okay. pulmonary doctors. Clear. Yep. You stick a tube in someone's windpipe and breathe for them. There's a lot of places where those people still manage the ventilator, even if there's critical care doctors around. So what do most of the patients you care for? Are most of the patients you care for elderly, or do they run the gamut of sort of young adult all the way up to elder? There are different diseases for every age that put you in the intensive care unit. You know from pediatrics that people may start their life on life support. If mm-hmm. they get born too early or have a lung or heart issue. Um, I see in the younger age tends to be people who are come in with either trauma or some congenital illness that now they've survived into adulthood or the big one are infections, mm-hmm. influenza. This is where we're seeing a lot of our younger people. And some years it's less and some years it's more. This year we seem to be seeing more younger people again. And by younger, I mean younger than 40. Sure. People who have kidney failure for a variety of reasons, um, those tend to be middle age, say 30 to the 60. Is that even middle age? I don't know anymore. It's, yeah, I think probably. I mean, I think most people would say 40 to 60. And then the elderly, because as we get older, uh, we get easier to get infections and other heart disease and kidney disease and lung disease. And eventually- we all pass away and die. Right. So are most of them like emergent situations, do you, or are they just sort of disease that has gotten worse and worse and worse and then people get into the ICU? So I'm going to make a comment that I always type, like to say, and that is when people die, it's always quick. Mm-hmm. So 
when they're coming to see me, it's usually an emergent situation. Okay. They may have had a chronic illness for years, and eventually it just has gotten bad enough that all of a sudden they kind of fall off the cliff, so to speak. Or they get an infection and their underlying illness makes it easier for them to just crash and burn. So one of the things that's interesting is people's schedules are so different in different types of medicine. You work week on, week off, if I'm if I remember correctly. So could you describe like what that actually means? So I work um, basically Monday through Sunday for somewhere between 12 and 16 hours a day for that seven days. And then I have seven days free. And even on those, those seven days you're on, though, you're technically on at night as well. Or you're, or you're not. Someone else take call for you or do you actually? Uh, the seven days that I'm on, there is someone else there overnight. Okay. That's why I don't have to be on for 24-hour shifts. Right. So sometimes I actually do pick up some of those night shifts when we need extra people there Mm -hmm. or someone's on vacation. And I could pull a 36-hour shift if I had to. And how many people do you technically or do you usually care for in the ICU at a time? Somewhere between 10 and 20 during the week. And on a weekend, I'll see um, up to 30. So do here's where we get into the difficult questions. Do most patients get better and then go back to the, I guess, assume the regular hospital? Or do most, like what percent, or do they, I assume they never go home straight from the ICU. There are people who come go home straight from the ICU. So a lot of times that's our younger patients that may have overdosed, get on life support. Once the medication or the drugs that they took works out of their system, Right. you take the breathing tube out. And most of those patients, once they're capable of um, breathing, can go home. Mm, okay. Sometimes they go home and we tell them it's not safe. Right. But they have a choice to do that once they're within their right mind. What percent do you think actually wind up going, getting stable, going home versus what percent don't and then die? Well, at Methodist where I work, there's multiple different ICUs. Some of the cardiovascular surgery ICU, there's the neurocritical care ICU, there's a couple medical ICUs and med surge ICUs, and it all depends on what you came in for. If you come in for a surgery and put you in the ICU because you need life support for six or 12 hours after the surgery, and we want to watch you for a day or two to make sure after we just drilled into your head or Mm -hmm. stuck big uh, vessels like your aorta, we want to make sure you're not going to bleed to death. But those patients might go home in one or two days. And if we crack your chest open and work on your heart, you might be out of the hospital in five days, which I think is amazing. Just mind-boggling, yeah. It, I mean, it's a minor miracle, maybe a major miracle that I think we take for granted, not yeah. only in the hospital, but I think uh, pretty much everyone takes that for granted. Oh, I'm still, like, every day I'm stunned. Like, just what we can do to the body, and then it just it fixes itself. And I mean, the idea even that you could open it up and do anything is amazing. It's just amazing. So you have one of those jobs that, like, I personally just, I could not handle. Like, I just, it's just not in me. Like, even when I was uh, a resident, uh, being on NICU almost broke me. I mean, that's probably why I, uh, NICU is neonatal intensive care unit. Um I didn't enjoy the medicine. I felt that, you know, some of the choices were being made were were, were difficult, even ethically, in, in what we did. Um, it's one of the major reasons I think I wanted to actually work on the healthcare system as opposed to uh, working on individual patients. In fact, probably my most widely read piece ever was just about, you know, how much I hated working in the NICU. Um, but you clearly enjoy dealing with the sickest of the sick. You clearly enjoy this weekend. And when you're on, it's it's got to be pretty intense. So how do you do that, I guess I'm asking? Well. Aaron, I think we're all, as you know, made for different things. Mm -hmm. And for the same reasons you don't like it, I actually liked it. Right. I enjoyed NICU. And I think if I had been pediatrics, I would have been probably a neonatologist because I would have thought I could make the most difference. Those ethical decisions, I I have a direct effect on how to help people through those. And while people may disagree, I can at least try to guide them. How do you do that? Honestly, I don't know how I got here to where I can do that, but right. I I do a decent job at it and I can help people guide it. But if you had if you knew me outside the hospital or if you know me when I was in college, I don't think anyone would guess that I could have that skill set. Mm-hmm. But something works. Yeah. I actually find a reward in helping people through that. Usually it's the families more than the patients because the patients sure. 
can't often talk on while they're on life support, but I can help the families with that because as you've said, we all die at some right. point. Um, and sometimes we can do great things and help someone live. And sometimes we can't. And helping people come to that decision is a, I think, rewarding experience. And it helps me get through those really hard struggling days. Do you find in general, I mean, one of the things that's often amazing to me is that when we talk about advanced directives and we talk about these decisions, that there's this implicit bias in it that I think people get fearful that they, they think that the healthcare system is going to act to like save money, that they're going to cut them off. But my, my personal experience has been often that doctors drive this, that, that, you know, it's the doctors that want to do everything and never lose a patient. Um, it's the healthcare system that drives it too far, even when I think sometimes patients or families seem maybe sort of more thoughtful about maybe this is time to let it go. But I totally own, I'm in the, like, I barely ever deal with this. So what is your impression of that? Do you find that families in general um, run the gamut? Do they, do they tend to favor do everything? Do they tend to favor, you know, a better understanding about when it's time to let someone go? And, and how do you think doctors deal with that as well? Well, I think families and doctors run the gamut. Okay. Sometimes you get match up where the doctors and the families agree. I'm not going to know a good percentage of them, but let's say that's a third of the time because I, there's a lot of times that we don't have difficulty with what we think's right and the families accept that. Then there's probably, you know, a quarter to a third of the time when families and the doctor disagree on what the right choice is. And then there's a lot of in between. Um, but, you know, there it is not uncommon for doctors to want to see something and fix something. Sure. That's not the same as saying we want to keep you alive forever. But doctors often say, okay, there's a new pneumonia. Let me fix it. And you, I sit there and often think, Yes, but we've gone through our fourth round of chemotherapy, and now that you've got this pneumonia and you don't have an immune system left, and I've got you on life support with heart, lung, kidney, and your liver shut down, it's time for me to step in and say, hey, maybe this isn't going to work. I don't tell people no, right. that they can't, we can't try these things. But I help them try to understand that what's the chance that we're actually going to help, and there's always a cost to doing it too. If I put someone on life support, I can injure their lungs. So I want to say, when you say cost, you don't even just mean financial. You're talking no. about like human cost as well. I'm, so, yeah. I'm talking about physical costs. In right. fact, I almost never actually know what the cost of anything I right. do is. And we, I'm sure you've yep. talked about that. And I don't even know how to figure that out. Yeah, right. Nobody knows. That's the thing. Is I don't even think the hospital could give you a straight answer. No. Um, I know sometimes various tests and that. But going back to the cost, the cost is to the human body. If you get put on a ventilator and you get an infection in your lung and you have a cancer in there and we have to start chopping pieces of the lung out because of the type of infection or the cancer, that's a cost to your body. Yeah. If we put you on dialysis, dialysis keeps you alive and sometimes the kidneys recover, but dialysis itself can hurt the kidneys. And so there's usually unmeasurable damage to it because no one knows how to measure that. Right. Um, I don't even think anyone knows how to measure the cost of any of these things. But we do know that the more people have bad things happen to them and the older they are, that those bad things that happen cut their life shorter and they have more problems afterwards. So how do you, how do you, I mean, maybe there's no good answer to this, but how do you help families sort of start to understand when you're going, when things are going too far? I usually try to, in my head, put a trend together. If this is the first time you've come into the hospital and you don't have a lot of other problems, you might die. We may not be able to save you, but we can usually keep you alive long enough for your body to recover. You may need permanent dialysis. Again, that's a cost. But you might be able to come off the ventilator. You might be able to, as I say, have four good days of your life for the three days you have to go to dialysis. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a fair trade if you were going to die otherwise. But if you've now been into the hospital for the fourth time this year or the fifth time this year, and there's data on this with heart failure and other diseases, that if you have frequent hospitalizations in a year, your chance of ever surviving and recovering have gone way down to almost nothing. If I see someone who's 85 and this is their fifth admission because they suck food in their lungs or even the stomach acids when they sleep and 
their lungs don't look like they're going to survive another go of it, I start talking to families. Mm -hmm. And obviously, there may be a time before the fifth admission that you need to think about that. But that trajectory I'm always trying to put in my head. And then I try to help people understand that, hey, this is getting near the end. Maybe it'd be better to be at home with your family than being stuck in the hospital. Sure. And do most people take it well? Do most people sort of have that discussion? Or how much denial do you see? There are a few people that take being told their loved one's going to die well. Yeah, that's probably not the way I should have framed it. So are there people that sort of come to accept that? Um, or do you do you see... Because this is part of the thing. I think you know the only experience I think most people have with this is what they see on TV or in the movies, which one's always one of two ways. One is this perfect acceptance where everything is lovely and it's flowers and roses and you know angels singing in the background. Or you know it's an absolute denial fight to the death. You know I'm not gonna I'm gonna never gonna listen to this at all. And I would imagine most people are at neither of those ends of the spectrum. Um, and so in the real world, uh, do most people sort of come to accept that? How much time does it take? How does it sort of go? I think it depends on how sick they are when I see them. Okay. And it depends on a lot of times if there's a lot of significant brain damage. Because a lot of people are willing to be alive hmm. or kept alive if their brain's working. And a lot of families are willing to keep their loved ones alive if they think the brain's okay. Now, that's not universal. There are people who are brain devastated. And they have either told their loved ones or the loved ones believe that they would be one of kept alive at all costs. And if that's the case, if they truly believe that, they can. Yeah. We, um, insurance will pay for that. Right. And there's pretty much no one that is told no, even if they don't have insurance, because as you asked earlier, whose who's choice is it? Yeah. We, we believe in this country that autonomy trumps yep. social justice. And that's the way I look at these things. Mm -hmm. However, there's a lot of people who, if I tell them, you know what, your loved one's dying, we're doing everything we can to save them. But when they get through this, they're not going to be able to go home. They're going to be able to take care of themselves. They may have to be dependent in a nursing facility the rest of their life. And they're like, oh, no, we don't want that. And he said, well, does your loved one want that? No. Well, then maybe we should talk about if they don't get better, then be comfortable. Yeah. And this isn't a one discussion. This isn't the discussion you have on day 10. Of course. And a lot of times that's what happens. Um, it should be a discussion at day one. Your loved ones come in, they're on life support. This means they might die. And if they don't have the life support in, they will die. And we're going to do everything we can to help them survive. But they may not ever come off this life support. And we need to start talking about what happens when they don't. So I've spent a lot of time asking you questions about, you know, people who are going to die. We should stress, for the record, the vast majority of people in the ICU get better. And am I wrong about that? Again, diagnosis. If you okay, come true. in with septic shock, 50% chance, roughly. Okay. If you come in with influenza that puts you on life support and you have acute respiratory distress syndrome, that's a that's a rough diagnosis to make it through. If you come in because you overdose, can we stop for one second. How when you, I I can't stress that enough because we've been going on about the flu uh, for the past few weeks, and I'm still getting so much flack that people are minimizing this. So that's one of the serious ones. Like if you come in with flu yeah. and acute, like so that's one where you may not recover. In fact, a significant number of people don't. In fact, we have had to put people on something called ECMO, which is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. It's a machine that not only really does the lungs, but it also oxygenates the blood outside the body and does basically part of what the heart does. Yeah. And if you end up on that, that's a really poor chance of survival, but it's, you know, we are able to keep some people alive. But if you have to get to that point, that's kind of like OR type um, machinery yeah. where we yeah. bypass the body right. and the heart just so we can keep you alive while we're cutting on you. Right. And we're using that to keep people alive on the ventilator and with these big hoses that if you saw them, Aaron, they're like your garden hose. No, I know. It's going through them. Even, even with uh, with babies, we, yeah. we've seen it enough. But it's, yeah. Well, it, yeah, it's crazy. Okay, so I, you know, I didn't want to interrupt you too much, but I wanted to stress the flu. So you were also talking about uh, overdose and other... Yeah, so if you come in with an overdose, I can usually keep you alive on life support long enough that 
you can get off the life support and go home. The biggest problem there is then how do we prevent you from overdosing again? Sometimes it's unintentional. Sometimes it's intentional. And those are hard issues. Mental health is a difficult thing. If you come in for a surgery, you're going to go home. And we usually, not every time. Of course, right. Because whenever we cut into somebody, there's a chance they die, even if we do everything right. Um, and then there's, you know, normal infections. If you get a pneumonia and I need to keep you alive and I can get you off the ventilator in less than a week, then you're probably going to do really well. Mm -hmm. If I start pushing two weeks or we have to do a tracheostomy tube, you might do okay. But if you've had to go two weeks, there's some other things going on or your disease was so bad that that's a six month to a year recovery if you recover. If you have an intensive care unit like we do at Methodist, it's large and we have a lot of beds. We tend to get people who are quite as sick sometimes in the intensive care unit. The smaller your ICU is, the higher acuity it is because right you guard those beds very preciously. Right. So you, you mentioned that one of the reasons you went into this is that you get to do procedures. Um, yes. And there are lots of, so what are the procedures that, you, that, are, that you're doing most of the time? So from a critical care standpoint, I do central lines, which is I put reasonably sized catheters in people's big vessels in their body, their neck vein, their vein that runs under their collarbone and the one in their groin. Um, we do dialysis catheters. I put breathing tubes in people. Um, I put tubes in their side of their chest when they have either air around their lung that's squishing it or fluid or pus or blood. Um, I also do from a pulmonary standpoint, and some ICU doctors do these as well, bronchoscopy where I take a scope and I look down in your lungs. Mm -hmm. So those are the, the major ones. So one of the few t one of the few times I've passed out uh, as a doctor um, was watching somebody get a chest tube once. Um, they were they had to, I can't I think it was trauma and they were either I don't know if it was long, blood or but watching them push that needle into the guy's chest and the I've never heard a man scream so loud in my life and I think it was the scream it was the it was the no, but him his pain and so I'm I'm always amazed at people that can do that because that was one of those moments I was like that I'm not doing that I'm gonna be clear that we usually make people less pain uh, yeah less painful we. Numb them up. Yep. We, if oh, yeah. we need to, we give them pain medicine. So for anyone out there that's listening, <laughs> yeah. it's not always torture. I'm going to guess, but just for the record, I assume you love your job. I do. I do. I like working with sick people. I like um, being able to do anything in the hospital that I need to do because I did internal medicine and pediatrics. I do general medicine well. At least I think. Yeah. Um, oh no. Let me let I me say for the record, Tyson is one of the few doctors my wife trusts. Um, and in fact, whenever <laughs> something has happened to one of our children, or even to her, um, she does not ask me what I think should be done or anything else. It's it's you have to ask Tyson. So, yes, whatever endorsement there is, absolutely, I have no doubt you're a very good doctor. Um, but I really enjoy the critical care stuff. So, and people choose different specialties for for different reasons. But Jenny, who you know, my yep, wife, yep. Um, she always told me when I came home from my critical care shift as a resident, she would say, you know what? You're there long hours. You're tired, but you're happy. Yeah. You know what? It's really interesting because I'm. you brought it up before, but it's always fascinating to me how sometimes people's outside personalities and job personalities are very different. Um, Amy always sort of talks about the, the few times ever she's seen work Aaron at home. Um, and the, I think people just sort of look at me sometimes like they cannot believe I'm a pediatrician. And I, I would also say that, you know, we, we've had many discussions about healthcare reform and everything else. And I would argue on many things we disagree. Um, but, but it is clear that, like, regardless of, of you know, you know how you you clearly like what you do. Um, and you're, I have no doubt having seen you even just, third hand with patients, um, that you clearly are super compassionate and incredibly good at this in ways that, um, that, that I, 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 it's beyond me. I don't know in what muscle to flex. my wife wish I was yeah. with everyone at home. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what muscle to flex, but, um, yeah, it is, it is sort of interesting how we all wind up in different professions, uh, and, and sort of doing what we do, but there's no doubt in my mind that, that, that you have chosen the right sort of specialty for you and that you thrive in this and that um, that you clearly are providing value. I mean, I, I could, you know, puff you up all day long here. But yeah, like, you don't need clear, to puff me up. Clearly, you're, you're providing incredible value to your patients. It's it's clear that I think that the that those you work with uh, also believe that as well. So uh, I'm glad you do what you do. Well, I'm glad you, you take care of this stuff because I have <laughs> no desire. <laughs> and there we go.
Let's turn after all of that to, to a, you know, what we usually do at this time when we answer questions from you for listening. Again, please go to healthcaretriage.info and get your questions in because we will get to many of them. As always, I'm going to ask Tyson to stick around and help me answer some of these, and we will get through as many as we can. Let's start with Erica. For oral contraceptives, I've heard that it's okay to start the next pack instead of taking the placebos to avoid having menstrual bleeding. However, this is typically followed by some guideline that you should take the placebos once a quarter. What research has been done to lead to this recommendation. For the record, I don't mind taking the placebos and having a period each month. I'm just curious because the every three month guideline seems a bit arbitrary. I don't know if there's any research into that at all. Do you? You actually are more of an adult dog than I am, so you might know. Yeah, but I don't do gynecology. Yeah, of course much. not. Just right. um, but from what I know is that you need to allow menstrual bleeding right. at least a few times a year. You would need a gynecologist to answer that more than that, but I'm sure that there's some unpleasant things that could happen if you didn't. This is where I'm uh, answering without as much knowledge as I would like. So I remember as before pre-medical school being told the same thing, that you had to go to the placebo week to give the body time to have a period and everything else. And, and I instinctively want to agree with you that we have to do that. But then when they have like the uh, longer acting, well, they, even the longer acting implants are only every three months. So I was thinking like, so maybe that's where the three month comes from is that we're, we're going to, we can give you continuous hormone for three months, um, but then we want it to stop. Of course, there are IUDs which release hormones though, although those are pretty low levels, I think. Those are lower so levels. Be different. So, so yeah, I, Probably every three months seems reasonable to me, given what we just said and given sort of what we do with implants. Um, but uh, clearly having hormones continuously for three months seems to be okay. Anonymous asks, one of the leading causes of medical errors resulting in serious harm is the failure of medical professionals to act on test results. Are there any practices in place that go beyond trusting the individual medical professional to interpret results or solutions receiving use that prompt attention of, to indicators of important patterns in a test result that may be outside those and the medical professional may be focused on? That, that was a little confusing. I think what you're getting at is you think that one of the leading causes of uh, medical errors is the doctors aren't acting on tests and other ways we could automate the system to make them better about this. So first, I may attack a little bit of the framing of your question there. I don't know that the leading cause of medical errors is that doctors are, are you know, misreading or ignoring your test results. Um, in fact, I tend to err on the side of I think we're getting too many medical tests. Um, and in fact, because of that, it's very hard to act. Also, I think often what people will do is say, hey, you know what, you know, three months ago, my CBC was slightly high and the doctor didn't act on that. And that was the indication that something terrible was going on. Well, part of the problem is when healthy people, a lot of these tests we've get, as we've discussed in previous episodes, is that we don't know what to do with them. And so we have guidelines and things we can act on, but those are almost always in very clear cut situations when it's, we know that this test should, so clearly there are certain things that yes, we could alert doctors better and we could try to get them to practice better. In fact, that's what so much of my funded research is about is a clinical decisions board and electronic medical records and trying to get docs to do the right thing. But rarely is that, oh my gosh, there was a bad lab test and you ignored it. Uh, I don't know that that is the major reason of medical errors. And in fact, I think probably one of the I mean, one of the biggest cause of medical errors is probably, you know, just adverse outcomes from things we do uh, as opposed to uh, not acting on the things that we could. I'm not denying that this ever happens. I'm just not sure that this is as prevalent as your question might suggest. You might feel differently. So I tend to agree with Aaron um, in his gestalt for that. I will say this. There are plenty of times when I have tests that come back to my pulmonary office that take a period of time for me to even get acknowledged that they were done. Because even with the electronic medical record, when you get enough notices in a day, you can't always figure out which one of those red numbers is important. Yep. Anonymous asks, does dairy cause inflammation? My mom thinks so and is urging me to eliminate dairy from my diet. Does the lactose in dairy cause the same kind of inflammation responses that added sugars do? Or is there something else in dairy that could cause inflammation? Oh, so many things in this question. Okay, first of all, if you've listened to Healthcare Triage before, if you watched Healthcare Triage, you know I'm not trying to push dairy. Um, I don't think, you know, we're the only adult mammals that drink milk. I don't know how much you need it. And there's a couple kids admitted probably to the hospital every year because they, they drank 
too much milk. Milk is caustic on your GI tract, and they wind up bleeding slowly to the point where they need to be admitted and sometimes get transfusion. So you can absolutely overdo the milk. Having said that, look, there's no... Milk is not the reason that, that people get inflammation and that people get sick and the da- dairy is not that bad. You know, everything in moderation, but, you know, there's there's no reason that you need to eliminate this stuff entirely or no reason to think that this is, you know, the thing that's that's hurting people and that that's, that's the problem that we the, – the reason that we have medical illness and that we have everything else. Everything in moderation is probably fine. I'm even reacting to your question about added sugars because while I'm not going to back up and say, oh, my God, you should have added sugars, added sugars are terrible. Naturally occurring sugars are fine. Added sugars are providing you really no nutritional value, and they're they're probably linked to obesity in some way. Having said that – you know, trying to link it to inflammation and again to say like, oh, your health problems are because you had added sugars is going too far. There's there's no really good evidence for that either. And so I would say you should always be thoughtful and mindful about what you're eating, but your mom telling you that you got to get rid of this stuff entirely because it's causing inflammation is probably overstepping what we know from science. What do you think? There are some people that have a natural genetic problem with dairy. My wife actually gets dizzy Mm -hmm. when she drinks too much dairy. Mm -hmm. And if you're one of those people, sure, sure, cut it down. She actually still has it sometimes. (laughs) Yes. But when she has it too bad, she gets dizzy. She cuts it out for a couple days to a week or two. She feels better. And then she realizes that she needs to smack herself in the hand and not do it much more. Um, If you're one of those people, definitely cut it down. If you have a lactose intolerance and it causes you to have diarrhea or other issues, don't use it. Yeah. Listen to your body. Right. Absolutely. But if you like it and you tolerate it fine, what? yeah, there's no secret inflammation going on in your body. The fact is, is that how many people in the world drink milk on a daily basis and how many go about a healthy life? Yeah, I would agree. The vast, yeah, there you go. Anonymous asks, when a kidney is removed, is there something put in its place to take up the space? I'm going to go right to you for this one. The answer is no. <laughs> They yeah. leave a, an empty space that your body fills in either with scar tissue and or fluid. Do you get weight loss? Like, does, is there, how, how heavy is a kidney? I'm, gosh, that's a good question. I bet a kidney is probably half a pound. Oh, and, it's only half a pound. And sure, you get weight loss until the body fills that space in. All right. Last question is from Lish. My friends keep harping at me about acidic bottled water and how it's destroying my health. How much, if at all, does the pH of my water matter? And is there any truth to the term dead water as far as hydration and other health benefits go? If you could, you can probably hear my eyes rolling. They, they are pretty far back in my head. All right, come on. Let's let's own the extremes, first of all. Truly acidic water is not good um, for reasons that we saw like in Flint, Michigan, because uh, then it can uh, actually start to corrode pipes. And if the pipes have lead, that's the problem with lead pipes. Many of the pipes are totally fine as long as we regulate uh, the acidity of the water so much. But if you get if you get corrosive, that's when you actually can get problems. But we're not talking about that. You're buying bottled water. It's totally fine. The idea that you should be concerned about the pH of it, that it's live or dead, is just the latest pen du jour. Um, there's no truth or evidence or anything behind that at all. Water filtration is arguably the greatest public health success of all time. Um, and I mean almost ever. And we're going past ba- maybe vaccines. I don't know. But clean water is great. Water that you just like let sit out and algae and crap grows in it is going to kill you. Um, so I don't understand this new rage uh, this is really sort of ignoring a lot of science and history, but if you're drinking bottled water, you're fine. Um, you don't need to worry about uh, whether it is live or dead. I, 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 Again, my eyes are still rolling back. I don't know where most people are getting this. I'm not even sure how you describe dead water because it, it didn't, <laughs> it's just didn't water, start alive. Right? It's H2O. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> so if, you're, if you are drinking water with bacteria in it, right. you are increasing your risk of death. Right. I get it. And yeah. Aaron, I'm going to echo Aaron on this. The two most beneficial health things that have ever been done are clean water and nutrition, after which is vaccine. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll even give you nutrition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just thinking, but like, actually, like, you know, no, I was maybe, I don't know if I was thinking nutrition is public health, and that's a good question, but I was thinking things that others can do. It's public health yeah. if you're in a nation that has that malnourishment. Absolutely true. Yes. We save more lives every year by exponential numbers with clean water. Yeah, I'll and, buy that. And good nutrition. I'll buy that. We save less but still exponentially more than I ever save 
with vaccines. I'll buy that. And, and then beyond that, antibiotics and other broad therapeutics that were the turn of the, you know, 19th, 20th century, yeah. we, we we save more people, again, than I will ever save yeah. or the chemo doctor will ever yeah, save. Yeah, and we've, we've talked about that because it's like, you know, if you go back 100 years, everyone was dying of infectious disease. And right. now it's like the tiny, tiny amount. It's it's the stuff we can't get. We've gotten to the point where people don't remember how horrible those oh, diseases yeah. were. Yeah. And that's why they choose not to do vaccines. Yeah. And that's, of course, why they die of other things when everybody, because you got to die of something. Anyway, that's a perfect ending to this episode. Thank you so much, Tyson, for being here. We really appreciate it. I appreciate you um, having me. As always, please go to healthcaretriage.info to get your questions in for next episode. We did not get to everyone's this week, as we rarely do, but we will still need many more. Please go there and, and get us your questions. While we've got you as well, a little bit of housekeeping. HCTmerch.com is your place to get merchandise for healthcare triage. Yes, it's DFTBA because some people worry, but regardless, you can get there quickly, HCTmerch.com. And of course, if you'd like to support the show in any way, Patreon.com slash healthcare triage. Patreon is a way for you, the listener, to help support the show in any way that you can. You don't have to. We will continue making healthcare triage and it will be free forever and no one ever needs to worry about that. But if you're inclined, Patreon.com slash healthcare triage. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you in a couple weeks.